Okay, so this is the last lecture. This is the reproduction. And you're going to find that a lot of the stuff we've already talked about before, like when we talk about leomyomas or tumors that go in the uterus, we've talked about that in the cancer section. When we talk about things like genetics and genetic disorders, we've already talked about it in the past lectures. So if it's on the slide, you're responsible for knowing it, but just keep in mind, if I don't spend a lot of time on something, it's probably because we talked about it in the past, and I usually point that out too. So I'm going to go through the reproduction section. There's a lot of really basic terminology um, as we go through these too. So let's get this thing started. All right, so the male anatomy. As we go through the male anatomy, kind of keep in mind there's an equivalent version of this in the female. Like when we talk about the gonads being the testis in a male, of course, the ovaries are the gonad in a woman. These both start as the same primitive gonad, whether you're male or female. And then about two weeks into um, pregnancy, it starts developing either as a male or a female. And by default, we are going to be naturally female. And I'll talk about a disorder where somebody's actually XY, but everything about them seems or appears female. When you look at the ductal system, even though we're talking about the duct work in a male, you can look at the equivalent. So when you're talking about the vas deferens, it's the equivalent of the fallopian tube in a woman. When you talk about, um, I'm trying to think, the external genitalia, even the, like the clitoris and the glans penis, they're basically the same structure because they're full of nerves, full of erectile tissue, um, but they're in just different sexes. So a lot of this anatomy, I'm not going to spend a ton of time on it, just more of a review just to remind you where your, your head should be and kind of get you back into the game as we go through reproduction. When you look at the different layers of the testis, one of the important things to remember about the testis is that this is an immunologically privileged area, which means your immune system shouldn't get in there. If a boy that doesn't make sperm until the age of 13 has a developing immune system, when he's 13, if his immune system can get into the testis, he'll actually try and destroy his own sperm. They'll try and basically kill it because it looks foreign to the body since it hasn't been there for 13 years. So this is really a protected area. And the important cells here are the Sertoli cells that actually nurture the sperm, they develop the sperm, and they form this blood testis barrier. So these are really important structural cells. They're stimulated, if you remember, by FSH, follicle stimulating hormone, to develop sperm. The Leydig cells are the other ones, and the Leydig cells are stimulated by LH, and they're there to develop testosterone. Remember, FSH and testosterone work together with the synergistic approach to help increase the production of sperm. So if somebody has decreased testosterone production, they can still make sperm, they're just not going to make as much. But if you lose the FSH, then they lose the ability to make the sperm. So if they have something like a prolactinoma that makes prolactin and it stops FSH, that person's actually infertile because they can't make sperm with FSH. All right, when you look at the development, the process spermatogenesis, it means literally to make or create sperm. It all starts from the spermatogonia, which is going to be a sperm. And what it does is it replicates through a process of mitosis where it makes two perfect twins. So you still have this original stem cell. And over the years, that stem cell is there being exposed to radiation, toxins in the environment, um, carcinogens like we talked about in the cancer section, all damaging these genes. So if this is mutated, let's say this person's like 40 years old and it's mutated, it makes replicas that are mutated. A lot of times we point fingers at the mom as, you know, over the age of 35, will she risk, increase the risk of Down syndrome and that's bad. But in the dad, over the age of 40, that sperm, that original sperm cell, has taken a lot of damage too. So it has risk. And in fact, it increases the risk of things like achondroplasia or dwarfism, increases the risk of autism, schizophrenia, and progeria. And progeria is where the little kids that are like 10 years old look like they're 90 because it's a rapidly aging disease. It makes them age very quickly. Okay, so after this mitosis goes through meiosis where it takes that 46 chromosomes and splits them in half. So half of these will have a Y, which is sex chromosome, half will be X sex chromosome. And those X's and Y's, of course, determine whether the baby's going to be boy or a girl. And this whole process of making this happens in the testis and the um, seminiferous tubules, and it takes about 60 days altogether to mature one batch of sperm. So even if he has an ejaculation every day, that sperm has been maturing for 60 days before it's ejaculated. The next thing you want to remember about um, the chemicals are testosterone. And there are really two key things about testosterone. First is masculinization. It makes the secondary sex characteristics, the masculine sex characters, come out. And it also is there for anabolism, which makes bone and muscle grow. So remember, anabolic steroids make things bigger, like muscles and, and bones dense. That's what anabolism is. It's building up. The other thing you want to remember that I didn't put in here, but I just told you, is it also is responsible for increasing the production of sperm. So not making sperm, but increasing its production with FSH. I kind of already did the overview of this passageway, but when you're looking at the anatomy of the male versus the female, just remember the way you should follow it is where's the gonad? 
and whatever's being made, the gamete, and the gonad has to leave the body somehow, so just follow the pathway. You've got the gonad itself with the epididymis sitting on the top, and the epididymis is there for maturing the sperm. Right? If the sperm go up here and they're matured and they're not used, then they'll actually be reabsorbed into the body. And then once they're from the epididymis during emissions phase, it'll move up through the vas deferens, up over the bladder, behind and into the prostate gland. And the prostate, remember, connects with the bladder, so you have reproductive and urinary tract at the same point here. And then it merges into the urethra, urethra goes through the, the penis, and then out. So the accessory glands are important there for adding things to the semen, like the prostate gland contributes nutrients for the sperm. Uh, seminal vesicles contribute um, fructose, so it gives you energy for the sperm. The uh, bubble urethra glands or the calcare glands, those are there to help lubricate the passageway. So as soon as he's aroused, it starts lubricating the passageway. And if any of these structures start swelling or they get a cancer or a tumor in it, it will block the passage for both sperm and the passage for urine. So it gives you some of the symptoms of being blocked up in, in both situations. Right, and then the external genitalia, of course, the penis and the scrotum. And the penis has this spongy tissue. And the reason the spongy tissue gets engorged is because of the blood vessels, the arteries. So what you want to think about is atherosclerosis. If it starts damaging the blood flow down to the penis or blood flow into the penis, of course, they're not going to be able to get an erection. So older guys that have really um, you know, bad arteries, they're going to have erectile dysfunctions as a result. And then the scrotum, of course, is there to help regulate the temperature and protect the uh, sperm because the sperm has to be about 2 to 3 degrees lower than body temperature all the time. Otherwise, it doesn't develop appropriately. That's why guys in the summertime that wear tight shorts, if they want to get pregnant, they're going to have a difficult time doing it because it decreases their sperm production. It actually damages the sperm. The sperm get reabsorbed by their Sertoli cells back into the body, and then uh, they don't have much to emit. That doesn't mean that they're sterile, so it's not a good contraceptive because they still could have some, some adequate swimmers out there. Right? Definitely remember your feedback loops. So if you look, the hypothalamus is at the top with the GNRH releases LH and FSH at the same time. They both get released pretty equally. The LH comes down and goes to the interstitial cells or the Leydig cells and stimulates testosterone production. And of course the testosterone affects um, aggressiveness on the CNS, kind of that uh, more of a drive in the CNS. It stimulates muscle growth, bone growth, and enhances secondary sex characteristics. And then it also comes up here and enhances the development of sperm. Right? But FSH first comes down here to the seminiferous tubules and goes to the Sertoli cells and tells them to start making the sperm, producing the sperm. And then testosterone just works as a synergist and boosts it. So since the sperm doesn't go um, back into the bloodstream to tell the hypothalamus it's done a good job, when you make sperm, you also make this chemical called inhibin. Inhibin is able to get into the bloodstream. It's a hormone. It goes all the way back up and stops production of FSH. So in my mind, I always imagine if I make 250 million sperm, I have 250 million molecules of inhibitin. I know I'm kind of exaggerating proportions, but it helps me remember because nobody will ever say, what's the proportion of inhibit to sperm? You will never, ever in your life hear that, I swear. So just think a one-to-one -one ratio. For every one sperm the body makes, it makes one inhibit. That way, that's a way for the hypothalamus and the anterior pituitary to know that they're making sperm effectively. Because if there's no inhibit release, what's it going to think? Well, I'm not making sperm, so this is going to turn up and make more sperm. So if there were a flaw with inhibin, this person would probably make way too much sperm. Or if inhibin was over-released, so if the, the tumor cell or a tumor cell produced too much inhibin, it would actually block FSH production, which would cause inf infertility. So always think about these things that you've learned in anatomy and physiology and how, how, what happens if you break it? How is it going to affect this activity? And hopefully throughout the semester you've kind of figured out that's exactly how you want to think. So the beautiful thing here is now we're talking about female reproduction is I kind of already reviewed it with the male. But you can go back through, all the glands are very similar. Like you have the Bartholin uh, bland, uh, glands, that they're a lot like the bulbourethral glands where they produce this uh, lubricant during intercourse and it helps basically ease intercourse or make intercourse more, more comfortable. All right, and then the ovaries, of course, are the gonads. And then what we have here is when you're developing the follicles, you get this thing called a primary follicle. And every month you actually have about about 12 different follicles that start developing, but there's one that's ideal, and that one is the one that's going to be released. So it's going to release that one egg. The other 11, roughly, are going to shrivel up into little scar tissue called atresia. So eventually, what's happening is she's just covering the surface of the ovary with scar tissue. And of course, that could be problematic if that scar tissue, if it, if it has any flaws or if those cells 
they don't go through apoptosis to turn into scar tissue and they just keep swelling. That can cause like a polyp or a, a cyst to grow on the, uh, uh, the ovary. And we'll talk briefly about that too. The gamete production is exactly like the male, except instead of calling it spermatogenesis, we call it oogenesis because it's going to, going to develop this thing called an oocyte. So it starts from an oogonia and it starts developing. And remember, her eggs actually are are developing before she's even born. So when she's born, she's going to have the most eggs she's ever had. And by the time she's even ready to go um, start ov her first ovulation, she's already lost lots and lots of those eggs that just scar up. They just start aging and they just get reabsorbed or, or scarred up along the ovary. And then two key hormones that you have to worry about here are estrogen and progesterone. There are a lot of hormones, but estrogens and progesterones are kind of the key ones because a lot of pathophysiology and a lot of um, drugs are, revolve around those two hormones. So estrogen, of course, is a feminizing hormone. It's like the equivalent of testosterone. Progesterone is kind of known as the hormone of pregnancy because progesterone comes out in the second half of her um, cycle when she's plumping up the uterus and trying to make it ideal for this fertilized egg to implant in. And then if it does implant and she becomes pregnant, then progesterone is what keeps that uterine line thick and dense all the way through pregnancy. All right, so some, uh, some situations, like if she can't make enough progesterone, the estrogen becomes dominant. It could cause things like mis miscarriage. Um, even during her normal cycle, if estrogen is more dominant, even during the time that progesterone is supposed to be there, it can cause a lot of pain and cramping, um, some bleeding disorders and things. So then the ductal system, like we were talking about when we talked about the vas deferens, you've got the equivalent of the uh, fallopian tubes, and then the uterus is about the size of a pear, and it's, well, pear-shaped, I guess it's a little smaller than a pear, but it's pear-shaped, and of course that's where pregnancy ideally happens. The fallopian tubes where fertilization happens, but pregnancy should happen in the uterus. Any time that pregnancy happens outside of the uterus, we call it an ectopic pregnancy. So if it happens in the fallopian tubes, a lot of people refer to it as a tubal pregnancy. Right? It could technically actually get fertilized and implant inside of her abdomen. Because when you're looking at the, the fimbriae that wrap around, I don't know if that's on the next picture or not. Oh, it sure isn't. So if you look at the fimbriae that wrap around or over the ovaries, remember they don't touch. When the egg's released, it floats in the abdomen. If a sperm is in there, it could fertilize that egg. That egg could implant in her large intestine, small intestine, anywhere in, in the abdominal cavity and start growing at that point. And that's an ectopic pregnancy. Right, and then the accessory glands, glands I kind of talked about, and of, of course the breast tissue we'll talk about with breast cancer too. So there are glands in there, the alveoli, not the, not the same as the lungs. It's similar shape, they perform a lot, but instead of holding air, they actually produce milk. But those little alveoli in the glands can actually have tumors that grow or develop in them and potentially become cancerous, which is what we talk about with breast cancer. Okay, so the menstrual cycle, the key with the menstrual cycle is that you've got this 28-day period, and right in the middle is ovulation at day 14. You can subdivide this into the days before and after day 14, and you can also subdivide it into what's happening at the ovary and what's happening at the uterus. Because both these cycles are kind of regulated by the same hormones, but what's happening with them is actually kind of different. Like when the cycle actually starts is the first day of menses, so she starts bleeding, but that's actually the first day that she starts developing a brand new egg. So it seems like that's a sign of loss and you know that her body is just kind of clearing everything away. But in reality, if you look at the ovarian cycle, that's when everything starts developing in the ovary. Around day 14, you can see that the uterus is nice and plump, and that's the moment of ovulation. Right? You can see that the hormones start changing around day 14. Estrogen has been kind of the dominant one up through the first, well, second half of the first 14 days, so roughly day 7 through 14. And then it causes this LH spike, which causes ovulation. If you don't remember that, you should definitely make a mental note of it. It's LH that causes ovulation, not estrogen. Right? And then during the second 14 days, you can see that the progesterone starts coming out to play for the first time, really. So around day 14, you see progesterone dramatically climbing, and it's peaking. And progesterone is actually what's responsible for maintaining that um, uterine lining during the second 14 days. And then throughout pregnancy, if she does get pregnant. And like I said, these are just slides that you can review. So the hormonal control or feedback, if you look in this and you compare it to the loop for testosterone, they look very much the same. One of the key differences though, well they have GnRH and FSH and LH and all that, one of the key differences is actually around estrogen. So estrogen, for about day, roughly day seven through day 13, estrogen slips into a positive feedback loop. 
where estrogen will be released around day seven, it'll go up to the hypothalamus and shut the hypothalamus off so it doesn't release any more FSH and LH. But the problem is that estrogen stays close to the ovary and it tells the ovary, let's make some more estrogen. And that new estrogen says, let's make more. So if you look at this loop, you can actually see estrogen right around day seven start skyrocketing because it's stuck in a positive feedback loop until it peaks right here and the anterior pituitary just pops boop, and it releases LH. So if you look right above, there's that LH spike and LH goes down to the ovary and causes ovulation. It causes it to release enzymes that free up the egg and let the egg be released. And then of course, that follicle now becomes the corpus luteum that releases lots of progesterone because it's collecting cholesterol and also estrogens. So I've spent a lot of time actually reviewing the main parts or the main things you need to remember from anatomy and physiology as we go into talking about the disorders. So let's start talking about some problems that happen. And while we're talking about women and cycles, let's go ahead and get these out of the way. But um, dysmenorrhea. So menorrhea, we're, we're referring to the menstrual cycle. So with dysmenorrhea, you're talking about dysfunctional or uncomfortable cycle. So this is painful. If it's primary, it's associated with prostaglandin release. And the way you want to think about this is when you have tissue damage, prostaglandins are released to let you know there's pain in the area. Well, when she starts menstruating, think of all that tissue that's dying off inside the uterine lining. It's releasing tons of prostaglandins. Well, if there are a lot of prostaglandins released, it can cause very uncomfortable pain sensation. So that's kind of the key with the primary. It's the uterus. It's the main structure here that's causing all of this pain. And then secondary dysmenorrhea is painful, but it's usually related to some other pathophysiology, or pathology, I should say, like an infection or an irritation or um, some other problem that's not specifically the uterus itself. Like it could be an infection that gets into the uterus, it could be an infection in the vagina, it can be um, an infection of the abdominal cavity that irritates the lining of the uterus. So there are lots of different things, but it just happens to happen around the same time as menstruation. Right? And then amenorrhea, amenorrhea, remember A is without, so it's out. So primary amenorrhea means that she hasn't had a period by the time she's 14. Remember, a lot of girls will start um, their menstrual cycle at around uh, age 11. So 11 to 13 is kind of the range, but if it hasn't happened by t the time she's 14, they call it primary amenorrhea. She doesn't have cycles, she doesn't have menstruation, and it's because she's never had it before. So this is where primary is kind of used different than we've seen it all the other times. And then secondary means that she started it, so she could have started having periods around 11 or 12 or whatever, but then suddenly they stop. So technically it's the absence of menstruation for a time of three months or, or more, or loss of six cycles. And then here's some of the causes. So you can have congenital defects, so maybe there's a, so there's a problem with the hypothalamus where you're not releasing the gonadotropin, right? So then you don't release FSH and LH, which means the cycle never actually starts because it's not getting the FSH and LH. That's really the purpose of the pill is to prevent this cycle from starting. But the pill, because it has progesterone and estrogen, plumps, plumps up the lining, and then when you go off of it, of course, it sheds the lining. So if you weren't taking these artificial hormones, what would happen is you'd actually have amenorrhea. Right? It could be genetic disorders or congenital malformations that happen. So something along that pathway, it could be, um, I'm trying to think, the hypothalamus, the anterior pituitary, it could be the ovary itself, it could be a dysfunctional receptors, maybe on the uterus, it could be lots of different things that are, that are going on there. Even trauma to the brain, I kind of skipped over that, but acquired CNS lesions or damage to the brain, if it's affecting the hypothalamus, the anterior pituitary, even like a, a tumor or something could, could cause that. And then secondary amenorrhea, of course, pregnancy is going to cause because it makes her skip her period for nine months. Typically, of course, there are always those exceptions. And then another thing is dramatic weight loss. And think about why. If you're developing eggs to, to birth a child or nurture a child in your, your body for nine months, you better make sure you have the proper nutrients. So sometimes when people go through dramatic weight loss situations or they're over-exercising or they're malnourished, they're not eating, then their cycles stop. They quit having a period because basically it's their body's way of saying, you know what, you need to worry about keeping you alive. There's no way you're going to keep a, you know, a baby alive inside of there. So they just stop the release of, of eggs until they can actually get back into that cycle. Another problem is that maybe they have anovulation. So if you're not ovulating, if you don't release, if you don't release eggs, of course, those hormones and those chemicals aren't going to go to the uterus and plump it up. So they're not going to get a period for that, that time. And it could be the same thing. It could be because of uh, hormone imbalances. Maybe the ovary is not sensitive to FSH 
Maybe it's um, that your body's not releasing FSH or LH. It could be any of those. And I talked about this before, hyperprolactinemia. So something like a prolactinoma. Prolactinoma, which causes too much prolactin, stops the release of FSH and LH, which would cause a stop of the menstrual cycle too. And then hirsutism. Basically with this, you want to think too many masculinizing hormones, too many androgens in their body. And DHEA is usually the one you want to point a finger to, but testosterone can do it too. So just having too many masculine hormones. So female bodybuilders are just huge, and if they take artificial testosterone, then you'd expect them, well, number one is to start looking more like a man, muscle size, bone density, hair, facial growth, but at the same time, you'd also expect them to stop menstruating. All right, so let's go back, and we're going to talk about men, male disorders, and then we'll talk about the female disorders. So here are the main groups, the testes and scrotum, then the prostate, and then the penis. So the first thing is the testes. And cryptorchidism, we may as well start at the beginning, is undescended testis. So by the time we're about a year old, 80% of us have our testis already in our scrotum. There are some that don't have it. Um, the major groups that you have to worry about are actually the preemies that don't have descended testis. So if they're not descended by the age of one, usually they'll do surgery to, to move it. And what's really common, whether they have the surgery or not, is infertility. So there's something about this pathway, something about the hormones that maybe it's if you don't have the proper hormones to descend the testis down along this path, maybe those hormones make it so that this testis doesn't work properly anyway. But So about 3% of regular babies and 20% of the preemies are going to have undescended testis. And there are actually areas of the world that, that the testis don't descend until later in life. I never remember. I should always look this up. But there's somewhere in South America, this, um, this village or this area that has this village, and they call it Hueva Stoches, which means eggs at 12, where these boys are born but their body's not sensitive to testosterone at the time, so they look very feminine. And I'll show you the, actually we, we looked at those disorders with uh, the endocrine. So they look very feminine. Their penis doesn't extend out very long, so it just looks like an oversized clitoris. The, the testis didn't descend, so the scrotum actually looks like labia. And they treat them like little girls until about the time they're 12 when the testosterone comes out, and it causes the testis to descend completely. They go into the scrotal sacs, the clitoris starts expanding out, it was never clitoris in the first place, but you know what I mean. It starts extending out like a regular penis, and then they go, whoa, congratulations, it's a boy. And then they married them off. Well, it's a genetic issue, so you have a tendency to see this happening over and over and over again. But because it's such, you know, such a common thing, they don't treat them abnormally, they don't treat them differently. They just let them get married, they let them have kids, and then basically the cycle happens again with their offspring. Right. So some other problems, hydrocele. So hydrocele, this is kind of a problem because the layers of the scrotum, if fluid starts accumulating there, the fluid, it's, it's basically edema. The fluid goes in and it causes swelling and swelling. Well, if it's not taken care of or resolved, it can put pressure on the blood vessels coming in. It can put pressure on the testis and it can cause irreversible damage. So one of the things they do to make sure that it's actually this hydrocele is they'll put a light, a small flashlight behind the scrotum and shine it through and then they can actually see the dark, dense mass of the testis there. And as long as this is all fluidy, the light comes penetrating through and they can see any irregularities. Well, it can actually resolve itself on its own within several months, but a lot of times what they do is they'll do something to drain it and clear it out. So the key here is that it's a common problem. It can resolve itself, but do you really want to take that chance? So next are infertility problems, and infertility is typically talking about the testis itself, typically. So the production or the quality of the sperm, maybe the swimmers aren't working right, maybe they're not making enough of the sperm. But there are a couple of really important reasons. One is because of bad development. And one correctable cause is something called a variceal. And a variceal is, the way I always remember is it's basically varicose veins of the testis. So with a variceal, the blood isn't moving efficiently through the spermatic cord. So in other words, this tissue is not being nourished appropriately. And when it's not nourished, well, then you can't develop the sperm. So that could be correctable. And another problem is blockage of the ductal system. So it could be a tumor, it can be some kind of compression, it could be um, some kind of scar tissue on the vas deferens or the epididymis or anywhere along the passageway that, that causes that. And the outcome would be either oligospermia or azospermia, which is low count or zero count at all. all right, and then the variceal, like I was talking about, the variceal is varicosities around the testis. Um, a lot of people call them a bag of worms because they look like varicose veins, basically, they look like a bag of worms in the scrotum. Next is torsion of the testis, and torsion means twisting. Two common times this happens is 
spontaneously around puberty or when there's some kind of a trauma or damage to the testis that causes it to twist inside the scrotum. Because if you start twisting the spermatic cord, blood flow decreases, you know, oxygen, nutrients decrease, and this tissue will actually die. Well, if the blood flow coming in is greater than that going out, you could actually have, you know, backed up flow, it can enlarge. But in general, what you get is lack of oxygen and lack of nutrients cause the testis itself to die. So even um, like a, a testis exam, like feeling the testis or it could shift the testis a little bit around inside the scrotal sac and cause problems, especially during puberty when everything's growing and changing and moving around in there. Uh, other times, I know it's funny to watch like America's Funniest Home Videos of a guy getting kicked in the testicle, but man, that could actually cause some really serious problems. And if that twists, like I said, that tissue dies and you can see the necrosis here, you can see the coagulated blood and everything. So bad news. Next, testicular cancer. So testicular cancers, um, they can be very aggressive or not very aggressive. They primarily happen in the age group of 15 to 35 years of age. So for my 35th birthday, we all went out and had a party because I didn't have testicular cancer and celebrate. Um, just kidding, we didn't do that. But those are the major age. Does that mean that somebody that's 40 or 50 years old can't get testicular cancer? No, it doesn't mean they can't. It just means these are the primary range. So here are some of the problems that can happen. It could be a germ cell tumor which means those stem cells, those are called seminomas, and they're the least aggressive, but they're also the most common. Um, testicular cancer is actually one of the highest rate cancers, like skin cancer. I mean, there's so many skin cancers out there, but a lot of people don't die from skin cancer because it's very curable. It's the same idea with testicular cancer. If it's identified early, it can be easily fixed. Um, a lot of times, it requ I don't know why I say a lot of times, almost all the time it requires removing the testis, which means you remove the whole tissue. So the nice thing about it not being very malignant often is remember that blood testis barrier? Well, it's a barrier that keeps things out of the testis, which also keeps things from moving from the testis into the blood, too. All right, so another way to diagnose it, you can feel the solid mass, or when you shine the flashlight behind the, the uh, scrotum. Normally, like I said before, when we we're talking about hydrocele, you can see light going through, but what if you shine that through and you see the testis, but you also see an abnormal mass over there? That means no translimination. It means it's a, a thick, solid mass. There's something there. Okay. Most of the times it's unilateral, so they just remove one testis, but you know, accidents happen where sometimes both have to, have to happen. So the causes can be undescended testis. There's just an issue that happens. Uh, I forgot to mention this with undescended testis, but it, risks, it increases the risk of testicular cancer. It could be because of a twist or torsion, or it could be because of just mutations, radiation exposure, infections. It's like orchitis is an infection of the testis. In childhood, it's commonly caused by measles and mumps. In adulthood, it's commonly caused by STDs. But both of these things can increase the risk of testicular cancer. So remember when we talked about cancers, that infection inflammation process can actually increase the risk of cancers and mutations. Right. So prostate. Uh, something that's more common is actually benign prostatic hypertrophy, which means, remember, hypertrophy means the existing cells just get bigger and bigger, where hyperplasia means you're growing brand new cells. So benign hy uh, prostatic hypertrophy, around the time that we're teens, our prostates start growing rapidly. And before our teen years, it's about the size of a pea, but then as we start developing in puberty, it gets to about the size of a walnut. Um, unfortunately, after the age of 40, it's still growing. So it can keep growing and growing and growing, which could cause compression or damage to the passages going through it. So here you can see, if you obstruct the flow, of course, if you obstruct the flow of the bladder, then everything starts backing up into the ureters, which can back up into the kidneys and cause problems. And we talked about these with the kidneys. So pyelonephritis means that it's backing up and actually damaging the, the kidneys. You get an infection up there and it's damaging the kidneys. Hydronephrosis is when we had that swelling or dilation because of the backed up water. And then uremia is just, remember, that group of symptoms that uh, symbolize kidney failure. So it can be bad news. It's, it's a blockage, right? Kidney stones, kidney stones can pass through, but when this um, prostate gets enlarged, there's no passing it through. It just keeps enlarging and causing more and more problems, which can damage your kidneys. All right, so prostate cancers typically happen over the age of 50, and they're actually the third leading uh, cause of cancer death in men. Uh, lung cancer is number one, bowel cancer is number two, and then prostate cancer is number three. And what's happening is the peripheral glands, remember glands are rapidly reproducing. So if one of these mutates and it just keeps growing and growing, it can grow and smash down into the prostate. And here you can actually see a prostate with a, 
all the destruction. Another problem is if these metastasize, if they get into the bloodstream, they have a tendency to metastasize to bone. So here you can see the vertebra, and you see all these little metastasized um, cancer cells throughout, or tumor cells throughout. These things, because they're glands in the prostate, they're testosterone driven or androgen driven. When a boy has testosterone, it goes up into the system and it stimulates the prostate to grow and develop. So if a, a, if a person had testicular cancer and had both testicles removed, they actually have a really low risk of getting prostate cancer because there's no testosterone to stimulate the prostate, which is another problem when people take artificial testosterone is they're overstimulating the prostate to cause prostate issues. So some of the ways that they, they find this is DRE. I'll give you a shiny nickel if you know what that is. In my book, or we joke about it, it's, whoa, my God, where are you putting that finger? Right, so digital rectal exam, that's DRE. And they can also test for serum markers. And I talked about this when we talked about cancers, but PSA, or prostate-specific antigen, if the prostate's developing, it releases an antigen. If you test the blood, the blood levels will naturally have some PSA in it, but when they get accelerated or high, that means there's a sign that something's you know, going overboard in the prostate, problems going overboard in the, in the prostate. Right. So now let's talk about the penis. So we'll start with the foreskin or the prepuce. And a couple of problems that happen here, phimosis is one of them. And with phimosis, you can see in the top picture is that the foreskin doesn't relax enough. So this should normally relax so that the gland's penis can move through it. And a problem here is it's not. So the gland's penis can't move through, which could cause a lot of problems with like erection. Or infection can be up and behind the gland's penis around here. Right. The next one's paraphimosis. And paraphimosis is just the opposite. Instead of the, um, the foreskin actually not being able to relax, the foreskin isn't long enough. So in situations like erection or uh, any time the penis has to move, it can't move. It can't stretch because the foreskin is not long enough. And then redundant foreskin is also known as re redundant, uh, redundant um, prepuce. And with that situation, there's just way too much foreskin on it. So the foreskin is always too long and it's always covering the gland's penis. Even during erection, it's covering the gland, gland's penis and it can cause infections. And the infections that usually happen are like STDs. So STDs get in there, they don't get cleaned off or cleared off, and then they start causing problems. The same thing can happen with like yeast infections. So yeast infections can get in there and cause problems. And then the glands itself, so the gland's penis is this part here. And uh, balanitis is, well in this situation you actually see candida, it's inflammation of the glands. So you can see that there's little areas of candida albicans, which is a yeast infection on the man. And then <clears throat> carcinoma, so cancers. Penile cancers, true penile cancers are actually rare and the most common cause is actually HPV. And when they first came out with Gardasil, they didn't, um, they didn't give it to boys because it wasn't, you know, it wasn't designed for boys, it was designed for women. But now they have it for men and for women because they do know that it does cause penile cancers. So we have that vaccine now. And the first signs of it are actually this thing called leukoplakia. And leukoplakia are little white scale-like structures that are on there, so little white areas. And they're not, they're not like pimples where they can be popped or whatever. They're actually a dense matter. They're just white plates of, of tumor-like structures that are growing. Right? And then impotency, of course, impotency is where you can't get an erection. And there are a lot of causes of impotency. It can be psychogenic. It can be stress. So remember, your blood vessels have to dilate to get an erection. If, you, if he's stressed, there's a lot of cortisol and adrenaline that's causing vasoconstriction, right? So even if the penis itself works fine, the spongy tissue works fine, the problem is that stress can cause it, and that's psychogenic. It can be um, other things like STDs can cause damage to the neurons that, that cause erection. Uh, it can just be blood flow, like uh, atherosclerosis in older men decreasing blood flow to the lower lower area, or even diabetes it does the same thing that we just talked about in the uh, endocrine system. So normally what happens is sexual stimulation or even stimulation of the gland's penis sends a parasympathetic uh, nervous system loop up to the spinal cord that causes erection. So the man's brain doesn't even have to be involved, but the neurons do have to be involved for that to happen. All right, so let's talk about the female reproductive problems. Right. So some of the structural abnormalities, actually we're going to go through these one at a time so I don't have to show it. But the uterus itself, when you look at the position, the uterus is right along the midline. So if you're looking you know, front to back and you're looking at a, a sagittal plane, it would be right along the sagittal plane. But when you look at it from a transverse, or a transverse, um, what was I saying? 
When you look at it from the side plane, that is a satchel plane, what am I talking about? When you look at it from the side plane, you can see that it can be straight up the midline, it can be antiverted, which means it's bent a little bit over the bladder, or it can actually be retroverted, which means it's bent a little bit back towards the colon. So these are all possible normal positions. Um, the key is actually it needs to stay a little bit mobile, and you know that, because when a baby's growing in it, it has to be mobile all the time. Right, so another problem that can happen is you can get uterine prolapse. So instead of it, here's a normal position where it's anterior flexed. What could happen is if it shifts upwards and it starts moving down to the vaginal canal, that's a prolapse. And you see the first degree is just vaginal shortening. So it's pushing down where the cervix is actually down in the vagina a little bit deeper, which causes vaginal shortening. The next phase, the second degree, means that the cervix is actually right at the opening. Um, so when you hear that word introitus, it's talking about right at the opening. And in this situation, it's talking about the opening of the vaginal canal. And then third degree is when the uterus actually comes completely out of the vagina. So it's, it's pushing its way out. And here you can see some situations where um, things are getting flipped around or pushed around. So some of the technical terms, a ciscocele is talking about the bladder doing it. So maybe there's nothing wrong with the actual uterus itself, but the bladder is pressing on the uterus, causing it to shift downwards. So the bladder is pushing out. Where a rectocele is, the rectum is doing it. The rectum's shifting over and it's shifting down and out of the vagina. So you've got the uterus, you've got the bladder, you've got the rectum. Any of those three things can shift out of the, of the vagina. Kind of the key here that causes the problems are the supporting muscles and ligaments. So who do you think is usually going to have these problems? People that had a lot of stretch to these muscles or the ligaments. Right, people that have been pregnant. So pregnancies can cause this. It can happen to people that have never been pregnant too. They can have some genetic uh, predisposition or have weak muscles in that area. So things like the muscles at the basement or the, uh, the floor of the um, pelvis or like uh, perineal muscles, if they're not strong enough and they don't contract strong enough to hold everything in place, you can actually see these um, like cystoceles, rectoceles, or, or uterine prolapse. Right, next, menstrual disorders. So dysmenorrhea, we actually talked about these. I forgot there were two slides in here. But this, I guess, is a review slide. And you can see some of the causes, and I already talked about the prostaglandins that change uh, that could happen. So dysmenorrhea versus amenorrhea. And then dysfunctional uh, uterine bleeding, or DUBs. This is when you have abnormal bleeding at different times or for different lengths. So when you look at some of these different things, like oligo amenorrhea, this is talking about having light, infrequent um, menstrual menstruations. So if you look at a time frame, they typically say that if you menstruate about every 35 days or more, which is abnormally long, because a normal cycle should be how long? About 28 days. Then you have something called oligomenorrhea. How about polymenorrhea? That means you have many in a normal time frame. So you have too many. So if you have them more frequent than every 21 days, you have polymenorrhea. And then the, uh, the next one we're talking about, menorrhagia, is talking about bleeding. Just think of hemorrhage. So when you hear menorrhagia, it's talking about menstruation and excessive bleeding. So menorrhagia is excessive bleeding, which is heavy or prolonged bleeding. Where meterrhagia is talking about irregular bleeding, so maybe spotting and things like that between cycles. And then the last one, when you mix the two words, it means that they're not only irregular, like spotting between cycles, but it's no longer spotting between cycles, it's having excessive bleeding in between normal cycles. So it's kind of a blend as you go across the board through there. And then PMS itself, um, I know that I've known a lot of women that, that they say, oh, you know, I'm PMSing. But technical PMS, if you look at the medical guidelines, is actually there are a hundred possible symptoms of PMS, but they're excessive. It's real PMS when it drives you to the point where it makes you not able to live your normal life. Like it makes you actually have to stay home regularly from work or you have such uncomfortable pain where it takes you to the ER. So this true PMS, or premenstrual syndrome, is actually like lots of different symptoms combined to such extreme that it causes dysfunction in your normal living. So a, a key thing that happens here is actually estrogen. So estrogen, the first half of your cycle, is there to help thicken the uterine lining, helping to prep the uterine lining, but progesterone comes out in the second half and prevents estrogen from causing cramping, contractions of the uterine lining. So during the second half, if you don't have the proper levels of progesterone but too much estrogen, it causes a lot of extreme pain, cramping. The estrogen causes mood, uh, like psychological, cardiovascular issues. So it's, this is actually a for real medical syndrome that, that is diagnosed. 
And then endometriosis, this is one you'll hear about a lot because it seems like, it, to me, it seems like it's becoming more and more common, but I don't know if that's actually technically true. But endometriosis, every month when you go through your cycle, the endometrium thickens. So here's the uterus and there's the endometrium, right? So the endometrium thickens and it thickens because of exposure to estrogen, right? So the estrogen causes it to rapidly proliferate or replicate and grow thicker and thicker. Well, normally what happens at the end of the cycle is you push all this endometrial tissue that's estrogen sensitive out through the vagina and out of your body completely. And you start with this nice clean uterus for the next cycle. But remember, the uterus has exposure to the abdomen. So if any of that debris moves up the fallopian tubes and goes into the abdomen, well, now it can't get out of the body. So what if it sticks here or it sticks here, or it sticks over here, or it sticks on the outside edge of the uterus? Once that endometrial tissue sticks all over, when you start releasing more estrogen for your next cycle, what's it going to do? It'll proliferate too. It's going to start growing wherever it's at and replicating. And then the, when the estrogen goes away, it just turns into scar tissue. So imagine this little bit, it's exposed one month here. Next month, it grows because of estrogen and then it turns into scar tissue. And the next month, it grows even more and turns into more scar tissue. And then every month, it grows more. Well, what's doing is it's gluing your abdominal organs together. It's gluing your abdominal organs to the... the uh, the abdominal wall, it's gluing things like the outside surface of the bladder so the bladder can't expand. It's gluing the outside part of the um, uterus so it doesn't want to expand very well. It can start forming all these little scar tissues all over the ovaries and cause problems with everything. So it causes lots of problems. And one of the keys is that your, your abdominal cavity has to be fluid. Otherwise, you start getting these visceral pains. So one of the key symptoms is every month the pain's worse, right? Because it's causing more and more problems. And the whole thing that it's causing it is estrogen. Right. So menopause. Menopause is the point where she's released her last egg. She's not releasing estrogen anymore because that egg normally comes from the follicle cell. So the follicle cell is developing, releasing estrogen, developing an egg, and then releases, bloop, and progesterone comes out. So at menopause, there are no more good eggs to be released. So what happens is all the things estrogen did for her every month are now gone. So the uterine lining is not going to thicken anymore. The vaginal... Um, covering is going to thin out and dry out because it's not prepping for intercourse. Her bones were depending on estrogen, so her bones are going to get more and more soft, more brittle, and they're going to get thinner, so it increases the risk of osteoporosis. All through the, um, all through her lifetime, the estrogen was actually helping prevent atherosclerosis. I mean, it's not perfect, but it helps prevent it better than what men have. So it's decreased her cardiovascular risk, but now that the estrogen's gone. Now she'll start getting more atherosclerotic plaques. So they start building up and building up. And the ASHD is atherosclerotic heart disease is what it leads to. So the plaques. But it can also cause other coronary heart diseases because estrogen is responsible for helping vasodilation and vasoconstriction during different, in different blood vessels. So that's what explains hot flashes. She gets these little spurts of estrogen and suddenly the peripheral tissues like the skin start getting all this blood flow to them. And she gets a surge. She starts turning red because of all that blood flow. She starts feeling hot and starts sweating, and that's a hot flash. It's because these little bursts of estrogen. Right? So just think of some of those symptoms. Whatever estrogen was doing for her before, like what about breast tissue? What's going to happen to her breast tissue after menopause? It's going to decrease, right? So her breast tissue decreases. What about DHEA? It doesn't decrease. So DHEA is becoming a more powerful hormone in her body than estrogen. So DHEA was masculinizing. She's going to probably have a little bit of facial hair growing. Maybe your voice gets a little bit deeper. Um, her sex drive usually goes up because of the DHEA, which increases sex drive. But the way you really identify that this is real menopause and not, not some other anatomic or physiological dis dysfunction is that when they do a blood test, she will have low levels of estrogen but high levels of FSH. Think about it. When estrogen comes out, it tells the hypothalamus not to make GnRH. Without GnRH, the anterior pituitary can't make FSH and LH. But now her estrogen is not being produced, so her hypothalamus is going, why? We need to turn up the GnRH. So what it does is it cranks up her GnRH, cranks up her FSH and LH, but there's still no egg developing because there was no egg to develop at all. So think about that sometimes with the pathways. And if you understand the pathways from index from the endocrine system, you can totally understand what to look for when you're looking at blood tests. So let's talk about infections. And I know we've talked about a lot of these infections back in the infections uh, lectures, but now let's talk about them a little bit more specifically. So vaginitis, there are really three types. There's a yeast. So remember, yeast is a fungus. And the most common fun fungus in the uh, vagina is candida albicans. It's a common 
fungus that hangs out there, but it's usually kept under control because of the acidity of the environment, the lack of sugars in the environment, um, just her immune system helping take care of this. But what if she has something like HIV? What if she's right around ovulation where the acidity actually goes, well, less acidic, the pH goes up, right? So it's more neutral to accept the sperm. In those situations, she's at higher risk for getting a yeast infection. So remember, candida is a fungus, which you know, fungus is a, basically making yeast, or it is a yeast, and it increases that risk of yeast infections. Uh, trichomonas is actually, it's, it's caused by a protozoa, which is a small animal. It's one of the smallest living animals out there. And it can, be, it can be sexually transmitted, but trichomonas can actually live normally in the vagina. The same thing, or basically the same idea as with candida. It can live in there, but if it becomes out of control, then it causes problems. And then bacterial vaginosis. So bacteria, and it's lots of different types of bacteria. Um, oops, there's a typo there. It should be Gardnella. Uh, I'm missing a, a letter in there. But Gardnella is a common group of bacteria, and it's one of the more common. About 50% of bacterial vaginosis is caused by Gardnella, uh, the Gardnella variety. Right. And then the key here is that these bacteria can live in her naturally, but if her immune system drops, if, um, if the pH starts changing, these things can be out of control, and they're kind of opportunistic. They can start taking over and they cause a lot of problems. And the key symptoms here are going to be irritation, itchiness, um, usually a discharge, especially with the yeast vaginalis, you'll see a lot of white discharge, which is the yeast. Um, or it can be purulent discharge, which is pus, right? So the infection when the white blood cells are going in trying to kill it, and then it discharges, but usually it has an odor to it too. Pelvic inflammatory disease. So a lot of times this is caused by infections like STDs. And Pelvic inflammatory disease doesn't have to necessarily be from an STD. It can be from something inside. Like even endometriosis can trigger pelvic inflammatory disease. A lot of times it's acute, especially with infections. because they get the infection, you take the antibiotics or um, antimicrobials, whatever you're taking, and it helps get rid of it, and then the pain goes away. But the key symptom with this is that actual pelvic pain. And every time that she moves and it shifts the uterus and it shifts everything inside, it causes more pain. When you look at the spread, so over here, as it's spreading, if it starts the original infection at the vagina, then it moves up and into the cervix, so it causes cervical issues. And then from that point, it moves up and into the uterus, so it causes endometriitis, which is the inflammation of the endometrial tissue. Okay? And then it can move up into the fallopian tubes, which is actually salponitis, which I didn't put in here. And then up to the uh, ovaries, which is oh, I always oophritis. I always stutter on the O's, like oogenesis, oocytes. But that's just the progression. So if it gets treated, if the vagina. Hmm. So there was a little bit of a glitch there, I think. Uh, anyway, so the complications are things like infertility. If it gets up and starts causing damage to the uterine lining, or especially when it gets up to the ovaries and causes damage then it can cause irreversible damage. And about, well, I, I don't want to say about, but it's usually between 10 and 25% of women that get pelvic inflammatory disease will actually become infertile as a result of it. But you can see some of the other problems. It's an infection of basically the reproductive tract. So it can cause scar tissue and adhesions. It can cause um, abnormal, discomfortable uh, urination because it irritates that pathway. I know it's not exactly the same pathway, but the pressure, the swelling of a full bladder, the pressure of the movement of urine going down and even the trickling of urine if it, if it uh, trickles downwards can cause irritation. And then irregular vaginal bleeding because of the damage it does to the uh, vaginal lining. So here are some examples of different types. But in this situation you can see this is the actual um, ovary that's swollen and irritated. So you can see the swelling over here. And down here you have the fallopian tube that's irritated and you can see how large and swollen it is. And even here you can see how thick the uterine lining is. Next is toxic shock syndrome. So toxic, I can't say it, toxic shock syndrome. Um, usually is accompanied by some kind of vaginal infection. I don't know why I said usually. It is accompanied by vaginal infection. Typically it's like a staph or a strep infection. So staph releases its own toxin and that toxin goes in and starts basically overwhelming um, the vaginal and uterine passageway. And all those toxins can start penetrating the bloodstream and cause big problems and relatively flat, uh, fast too. So usually the signs of toxic shock, still can't say it, toxic 
shock syndrome. I need to say that 50 times really fast and get it out of the way. Um, usual symptoms are, of course, with infection, you're going to see a fever. So a lot of times a fever turns up. But another problem that happens is that toxins released from staph causes a drop in blood pressure. So it's looking like shock, right? So the blood pressure drops. They start feeling tired. They feel really sleepy. Because it's causing vasodilation, you usually see redness in the skin, maybe even a rash that's forming. And this can happen within hours of the infection. So the most common problem that's happening here is that when somebody puts a tampon in and they don't change it regularly, the, this bacteria starts growing in this warm, wet environment inside the tampon, and it releases its toxins out into the environment. I remember there were a bunch of girls, um, one of the Scandinavian countries, they were dipping tampons in um, vodka and then inserting them before class and going to school and leaving them in all day, and then they were getting really bad toxic shock syndrome because even though it's an alcohol, there are parts parts of the uh, tampon that aren't exposed to the alcohol, or once they've absorbed it, then that tampon's still in, and the bacteria is growing and causing problems. And usually when the symptoms kick in are right after menses is over. So they've been using it, they've been exp exposed to all these toxins, and the toxins start causing these symptoms like the fever, the drop of blood pressure, they feel really tired and sleepy. The, the more advanced it becomes, they get confused, they go into a stupor, they go into a coma, and they can actually die from it. So this is, this is something that, they, that a lot of women will go to the emergency room for and have to be treated for. Uh, because if they go into a coma and there's still all these toxins in, it can cause multiple organ failure, like the lungs will start shutting down, the kidney will start shutting down, and we've talked about multiple organ failure before. Okay, and then Bartholin cyst. Uh, the Bartholin glands, remember, are the glands that release that lubricant for intercourse. And if they get infected or swollen, these are lubricant glands. They have lots of nutrients actually in them. And when they become inflamed, they don't pop. It's not like a pimple. It looks like a large pimple, but they don't pop themselves. And they can cause more infections. That infection can move backwards and into the blood and cause big, big problems. So they have to be fixed. And then tumors. You can see the different places that tumors happen. And when it's happening along the, uh, the uh, uterus, we call them leomyomas, like up here. So different locations. It can happen on top of the ovaries. So it can be an ovarian cyst, which is benign, or it can actually be an ovarian cancer, which is malignant and causes lots of damage. You can have a vaginal or cervical cancer, which, of course, um, actually, I'll just go into the slides. Cervical cancer you hear about a lot because of HPV. Right? So here you go, cervical cancers. A lot of times they're benign and we call them cervical polyps. And you can see the little swellings over there. You can see the irritations. Uh, if I can get my mouse to go there. Whoops, right over it. So there's the swelling, the irritations. You can see them. And they're benign. They can actually be cut off or removed and they're cured. But malignant is where you have a problem. So that malignant can actually metastasize. And a lot of times it will go up through the breast tissue or the lungs or the brain and cause problems. And the main cause is HPV, human papillomavirus. And that's why Gardasil is out there is to prevent that, right? It's a vaccine. So they get pap smears regularly to look to see if there's any changes. And we talked about this when we talked about viruses and cancers. So this is more of kind of a reminder. And then uterine tumors. So the benign ones they call fibroids. And actually about 80% of women out there will get fibroids in their life. Um, some of them may be so small that they're asymptomatic. A lot of times they come on right, the pain actually comes on right after men's, uh, the menstrual cycle or during menses. So these are called leomyomas. They're a tumor that's growing in the smooth muscle of the uterine lining, right? And then after menopause, that doesn't happen because they're estrogen dependent, right? So when the estrogen levels drop, you don't get those. And then the malignant ones are really dangerous. They, it's kind of a question about whether they're estrogen related or not. They think that you know there's a connection. If you start taking estrogen after um, menopause, there's some kind of biological clock event that happened, kind of like bone growth. You know, estrogen and testosterone come out and they stimulate bone growth, but estrogen and testosterone come out and they also shut off bone growth at the end of puberty. So there must be some kind of a biological clock thing that says, hey, the body shouldn't have estrogen. And then now suddenly that estrogen starts feeding these tumors and causes them to uh, break free and move. And the PMB for a diagnosis, one of the signs is that they've been through menopause and now they have the postmenopausal bleeding. So menopause is over and then suddenly they start bleeding again. It looks kind of curious and they get checked out. Right, so that could be a sign of a um, malignant tumor. Okay, and I already talked about this a little bit, but uh, half women are going to get them through the reproductive years, and about 80% of women will actually have one in their life, whether it's symptomatic or asymptomatic. Okay, and then the ovary. So you can have benign ones, and we've actually talked about this a little bit before in tumors, but 
you have these functional tumors which are just basically regular follicles that have developed and become a follicular cyst and they can actually resolve themselves with time too. So they can come out and then they can go away. Sometimes they come out, they stay there and they just cause irritation. Um, sometimes it's the corpus luteum. So once the egg's been released, released, that corpus luteum just keeps getting bigger and it gets swollen. And a lot of times these you can see, you know, visually see. So if you uh, put a scope up there, you can see them. Um, Non-functional ones are like a teratoma we talked about before. And a teratoma starts as a stem cell. And when you pull it out, a lot of times it has hair and teeth and structures inside of a piece of skin. It was never, it was never a baby. It was actually just a stem cell that didn't know what it was going to be. And it started turning on, you know, pathways for hair and skin and other tissues. All right, and then malignant ones. So malignants, the average age for a malignant ovarian cancer is actually about 40, and there are really two types. You have epithelial or the lining tumors, and you also have the germ cell tumors. So the epithelial or the lining cell tumors, I know epithelium reproduces quickly, but usually they're at the surface, so they're up at the superficial area. And the superficial area, remember, is avascular, so it reduces the risk. But the germ cell, these things are extremely aggressive and very dangerous. So these are the original, basically, stem cells in the ovary that are doing it. And you see these a lot more in children and adolescents when this is happening. Right. And then here you can, you can see a couple examples. So there they are. There are the tumors on the ovaries. They're just enormous. You can see the size of the whole tumor going through here. Right. And then you can see over to the right side, you have seeding. So over here on the right side, you can see the seeding, and the seeding is all these little spots where this is metastasized all over the abdominal organs, and that's very, very dangerous. And I don't really think I have to explain that to you. All right, so breast disorders, moving on to the, the last part of the tissues. So fibrocystic breasts are exactly what it sounds like. They're lumpy breasts because they have all these small cyst-like structures, and this, the cause is unknown, but there are some genetic um, predisposition to it, too. Uh, fibroadenoma is telling you exactly that it's adenoma, so it's epithelial tissues, the glands themselves that are actually growing this fibrous cyst. So a lot of times these are benign, they can be removed very easily. And they happen more commonly in like young puberty age girls and, uh, boy that's twice that happened. So these fibroadenomas are typically non-tender, so you can feel you can palpitate them, they feel like a mass itself there. And so a lot of it depends on actually estrogen-dependent activities. And you can tell by the age, 15 to 25. And then introductal papillomas. The introductal is referring to it actually being in the milk ducts itself. So it's a tumor that's growing in the milk ducts. And remember, tumors produce rapid replication, rapid production of whatever the cell they are. So in this situation, they start actually having milk production. So they'll start lactating or causing milk production even if they're not pregnant. And then the last one, the mammary duct ectasia. Ectasia is referring to dilation or expansion. So something happened to the ducts, and a lot of times this can be post-pregnancy um, or during pregnancy. It can be any time that they're lactating, so if there's any other cause that's causing lactase, or even postmenopausal. So sometimes that postmenopausal breast tissue can expand, and it starts filling fluid, and then they get this nipple discharge as a result. So the ducts fill with debris, basically tissue debris. Um, it could be as broken down debris in postmenopausal. It can actually be from pregnancy having... You know, kind of a cleanup process that's, that's going on. Right. And then breast cancer, we talked about this when we talked about cancers, about one in eight women in the United States are going to get some form of breast cancer, and they're typically intraductal carcinomas. So when we were talking about the intraductal papillomas before, those are just the cells forming a tumor, but now it's actually turned into a cancer. About 50%, you can look at the location, it's in the upper outer quadrant, so the upper lateral quadrant. And that's why when they do the breast exams, they really have you pushing over in that side and feeling because that's where a lot of them are going to develop. And the cancer in situ, remember, in, cancer in situ means it's isolated to that tissue. It hasn't invaded any of the surrounding tissues. So this is like the best bet is to catch it right there and get it out as fast as possible. And they call that mammary dysplasia. So going all the way back to the very first week of class when we talked about dysplasia, dysplasia is abnormal development, right? It's not like metaplasia. Dysplasia is usually indicating that it's a cancer. And then the risk factors, of course, family history, the BRCA gene, um, your menstrual history, your regularity, the issues that have happened, um, reproductive history, etc. So pathology during pregnancy, morning sickness. So morning sickness is talking about that feeling, that vomity feeling, even the nausea that can happen 
um, in the mornings. And it's not necessarily just the mornings. It can be any time of day. And it can be triggered by lots of things. Uh, the primary culprit is actually estrogen fluctuations, but it can also be the HCG, that human chorionic gonadotropin, the pregnancy hormone, the one that triggers or identifies pregnancy, that the pregnancy tests are based off of. It can be because of that. And most of these cases will actually go away by the 12th week, week of pregnancy. So they're not always a, a permanent type of thing. But some women, they just have to deal with it the whole time they're pregnant. And I know if you were that person or if you know that person, you're like, oh, I can definitely tell you a different story. Um, when it's more severe, hyperemesis gravidiarum, this is a more severe type that they're constantly vomiting. They're losing lots of electrolytes and um, cause more severe issues. Another pro problem that can happen is a spontaneous abortion. Um, childbirth and child development and like I should say pregnancy and pregnancy development is just a, a kind of a miracle anyway. I was listening to a channel on the radio and they were talking about in reality about one in five pregnancies actually result in a live birth because there's so many things that can go wrong. We talked about this in the genetics section. But a spontaneous abortion is exactly that. It's spontaneous. And there are really three general types. There are more categories, but there are three general. So I'm going to go from one end, the complete. Complete is when there's a spontaneous abortion and the, everything that was the fetus is expelled from the body. So there's really no medical intervention that has to happen here. The entire fetus is expelled. Um, mist is exactly the opposite. It's where the abortion happens, the spontaneous abortion happens, and the fetus is not expelled from the body. It's actually still inside of the mother, so there's definitely medical intervention that has to happen there. And incomplete is actually in between, where part of it um, can come out, but not all of the tissue comes out. Like maybe the placenta stays behind, or some, some part of the tissue stays behind. And then ectopic pregnancy. Ectopic just literally means abnormal. It's an abnormal location, whether it's in the fallopian tubes, whether it's in the abdominal cavity instead of in the uterus itself. Um, those are all considered ectopic pregnancies. Right? And then toxemia of pregnancy is actually kind of an old school name, and we know it more familiarly as preeclampsia. So with preeclampsia, what's happening is there's damage to the lining near the uterine or the ovary, and it's producing all these extra tissues. So something's happened, and it's typically hypoxia. So hypoxia... Um, of the uterus, where the uterus isn't getting enough uh, oxygen and it starts basically sloughing off pieces or losing different pieces. So that preeclampsia causes a lot of risk or a lot of dan or a danger that could come along with pregnancy. Preeclampsia, um, I'm, I'm trying to think of the best way to talk about this. It, well, it, it causes hypertension, right? So the blood pressure is going to raise. It also causes increased proteins in the blood, which causes her to retain more water, and it can also cause proteinuria. So some of these little tiny fragments can actually slip through the kidneys and get out into the kidneys. So those are kind of the key signs, the hypertension, the proteinuria, and then the edema because of all the extra water retention in the rest of the body. Preeclampsia versus eclampsia. Um, eclampsia really only has one extra characteristic and it's convulsions. The, the body has enough toxic levels and Toxemia is actually kind of a misnomer because it's not toxins, it's, it's water. But it has enough um, changes in the fluid of the blood and enough changes in the protein levels in the blood that it causes imbalances. So just imagine, if you're retaining too much water in the blood, it can cause things like um, hyponatremia, hypokalemia, and situations like that. It can cause problems with electrolyte imbalances, but it can cause convulsions because the brain starts responding to it. So really the difference between preeclampsia and eclampsia is that convulsion factor. Um, there's another category here that's called HELP. It's H-E-L-L-P that I don't have in the slides, um, and I'm actually going to have you look it up. But that can include hemolysis, where she starts breaking down too much blood. It's very similar to preeclampsia. Um, the letters HELP, actually, H-E-L-L and P, stand for hemolysis, the first letter. And then elevated liver enzymes, which is the E-L, elevated li liver enzymes. And then the L-P is also little platelets. But it's very similar to preeclampsia, and I'm not going to talk more about it because I'm actually going to give you a homework assignment to, to look into it yourself. But because preeclampsia is very common, uh, I really want you to understand that or know it. And the placental problems, placenta previa, means that the placenta is actually sitting down the lower part of the uterus. It's shifted down close to the cervix, and it could actually be covering up the cervix completely. And if that happens, of course, you can't give a natural birth because... Um, the cervix is covered. And another risk is that as the uterus grows, the placenta could actually break free and move through the cervix, which would be abrupto placenta, which means that the placenta breaks free from the uterine wall, which is bad because that's the blood supply and that's the nutrient supply for, for the baby. So placenta previa is basically telling the location, the abrupto, uh, abruptio 
placenta is actually saying it's broken free. Right? And the last one, so they actually call this mower pregnancy, and this is just an abnormal tumor that's developing inside the uterus while the baby's growing in there. So it could cause problems, or it could be in a location that's not you know, causing problems. Uh, like I know that uh, my wife had, had the situation, and there was actually a, a tumor growing in a different area. Sometimes this can resolve at the end of pregnancy because the hormones change and it can go down. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a tumor tumor that's a permanent structure but it may also pro progress and turn into a more dangerous carcinoma. And then preterm birth, so about 8% of all U.S. Uh, births are preterm. And what happens is typically is pre a rupture of the membranes prematurely because once the water breaks and it's released, then you're committed basically to have that baby. The baby has to come out. Uh, trauma during pregnancy can happen, so about 1 in 12 pregnancies. And the things to watch for are, are the... BOW, so bag of waters is what BOW stands for. So abnormal uterine contractions, so they, they tell them these things, these warning signs. So the contractions happening prematurely, or are they happening f very frequently, too close together? Um, is the abdomen extremely tender or irritable? They want to um, hook up a monitor and monitor the fetal heart rate, which is FHR, and then they watch for things like vaginal bleeding because that shouldn't be happening. Uh, another problem that could happen is maternal hemorrhages. So the mom's blood supply could be damaged or threatened, and the mom could actually bleed out. It could cause hemorrhagic shock while the baby's in there. Um, it could also be after the baby's born. There could be damage or tears to any of the blood vessels in the uterus or the uterine lining um, when she could bleed out, and that would be maternal hemorrhage. And, of course, we talked about Sheehan syndrome, where there's actually a rupture up by the uh, um, pituitary, and it causes hypopituitarism, which is Sheehan syndrome, which is postpartum hypopituitarism. Right. And then endometriitis, or endometriitis, I, I can't even get that out appropriately, but it's not osis, it's itis, which means it's an inflammation of the actual endometrial tissue. And you see this about one in three vaginal births, and um, in C-sections you actually see it more commonly, and, which is expected because you have all that cutting and damage to the uterine lining, you'd expect some kind of inflammation. But this can also happen commonly if women are in labor for over 24 hours. So if they're pushing and pushing and pushing, um, you know, and they're stressing really hard and bacteria or an infective agent goes up in there, it can actually cause an inflammation or infection to happen. And then the last part, the STDs. We've already covered most of these STDs in the infection section, so I'm just going to kind of review them. But AIDS, you already know the problem. AIDS attacks T cells. So it's the T helper cells, remember, that are helping tell all the other cells what's going on. You can have this happen it can happen during pregnancy, it can happen after pregnancy. It doesn't happen so much during pregnancy anymore because of our sterile environments, but it was a bigger risk because there's so much blood that's going on. Um, the same thing, if the baby didn't have HIV when it's born, if mom does, there's a risk that it could get it during this, this stage. Um, you already know HIV comes right along with a lot of other uh, problems like TB. It brings along things like Kaposi sarcoma. Um, you have a higher risk for things like that because these are opportunistic viruses, basically, and opportunistic bacteria that are getting in with HIV. So HIV also likes to attack the GI tract and the um, reproductive tract. So like I said, we've talked about all of this before, how you test for it, and then we even talked about the treatment. So you can go back and look at the infection section because we have a huge section on HIV that we talked about then. Right. And then here are some of the major STDs that you have to worry about. Chlamydia is the most frequent bacterial STD. They call the, the silent STD because a lot of time, or most of the time, it's actually asymptomatic, which means you could have it, you've got it, and you're spreading it, and you had no idea you had it. But it's transmitted through all the routes that are mucus lining, so oral, anal, genital, any of those different things. Um, if it's through oral, it could actually get into the eye tissue and cause things like conjunctivitis, and we talked about that when we talked about vision too. But it has typically about a three-week incubation stage that it's growing and developing. Gonorrhea. Another big problem. Gonorrhea used to be really a huge problem at the beginning of the century. Um, I say century, I'm talking about the 1900s. I guess I'm still old school and I think the beginning of the century is being last century. But it was a big problem and then we came out with antibiotics like penicillin which really, really decreased the level of gonorrhea. But now gonorrhea is being more antibiotic resistant and it's causing the problem it's making a comeback. So it's getting this resurgence and coming back. So gonorrhea is the same problem as chlamydia. A lot of times it can be asymptomatic. When it does have symptoms, it has a lot of similar symptoms, like you get these little things called chancers. So chancers are little sores that are uh, developing in, on the genitalia. 
and then syphilis. Syphilis is also bacteria, but syphilis likes to go straight for the neurons. So it shoots for the neurons, and it can actually move up through your central nervous system and cause even more problems. Okay, so anyway, with syphilis, it gets into the neurons, and it has a tendency to travel up to the brain. I don't know why I say a tendency. Its goal is to travel to the brain. It's kind of like rabies. It wants to get up in your brain and then start causing lots of problems. But with syphilis, one of the first stages, you can actually see physical symptoms out here on the outside, like you can get these sores. But it doesn't always give the sores. So when it does give the sores in the primary stages, so within two or three weeks of infection, you can get these hard, painless chancers. So they just look these, like these ugly, nasty little structures. Secondary syphilis can actually appear months later. And the secondary syphilis um, usually appears more like a, a fever or an infection. And then tertiary syphilis can actually happen years or even decades later. Uh, and a very famous person that had syphilis, actually a lot of the famous people from you know, long ago, was Beethoven. And Beethoven, syphilis got up into his brain, it caused some dementia, it caused problems with his memory, and also affected his hearing. So if you ever watch uh, like Immortal Blood, it was actually a movie about Beethoven and, and uh, what happened with him. Once it gets into your brain, you, you don't get it out. So it stays up in the brain. Whoops, uh, there we go. And then chanceroids. So chanceroids is another infective, dis infective disorder, but this has a soft cancer. So, and these are very painful. And you can see they even look painful because the middle of them is actually necrotic tissue. So it's dyed and it's caused this, this well, dead tissue, which is very sensitive, very irritable, and very sensitive to other infections too. And this was something that you really didn't see very much in the United States, but now it's making kind of a, a growth in urban United States. And then genital herpes, we talked about this when we talked about viruses before. So type 1 is up at the mouth, type 2 is down at the genitalia, and this usually has a really short incubation phase. So you can get it and you can start spreading it within a couple of weeks of actually getting it. And then hepatitis B and C we talked about when we talked about the liver. And remember, B and C are the ones that are transmitted through body fluids, like um, even IV use or sexual transmission. General warts, HPV is your big culprit. So there are about 150, actually, different types of HPV, and a lot of them can cause these little genital warts. So not all of them are known to cause cancer, but the genital warts, about 40 to 90% of uh, people that are exposed to it will get these gen genital warts, and they call it condylomata acuminata. And I remember we talked about this already before, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time because I always joke about the name. It sounds like some kind of a tropical drink. It's definitely something you don't want to bring back from the tropics, right? Um, it has a little bit longer incubation than the other uh, different types of STDs, but it's actually the most frequent STD. And the most frequent because I mean, you can have it and not even know. You could swab a table you know, and usually find some kind of form of HPV. It doesn't always have to be genital warts, but HPV can cause warts on your hand, and your arms, and other parts of your body, your feet, and stuff like that too. But it's estimated that about 60% of the sexually active women in the United States have that, and that really prompted the reason for vaccines and the whole battle of whether we should vaccinate uh, the younger generation to get rid of it, because you can see it can get really nasty. And then different types of chancers. So here you can see a chanceroid that's happening from the... Uh, bacterial infection. Here you can see syphilis from a different bacterial infection. Here you see herpes that happened from a viral infection. So those are the uh, different types. And the last homework question, if I can get this thing to pop up, is right here. There we go. So the last homework question, number nine and number ten. So all I have to do is go back and what is the difference between preeclampsia, help, and eclampsia? And I kind of already told you in the video, but you can look it up on your own too because it's really interesting to look for. And then the last question ever for the whole semester is according to the CDC, what is the greatest risk to women in pregnancy? So I put greatest risk to women in pregnancy because I really, I think you should just search for it online, like Google it. And then the CDC will pop up in one of those options. And then what is the greatest risk to women in pregnancy? What causes it? How frequent is it? And what's the potential outcomes of it? So you may have not known this. You may have actually been pregnant and not known how dangerous this was and uh, how you got it. But that's everything. So thanks for a, an interesting semester. It's been a really long semester and a very challenging semester for both you and me. Uh, but I'm really glad you stuck through to the end.